It's always a challenge to talk to people when they're eating, right? To keep their attention. So I'm going to do my Anna Patak. Uh, we're just like the way that we present. So it's kind of like we will not be focused on your food that much. So anyway, I want to start with very important, uh, two very important things. First of all, uh, that five minute piece is obviously about me receiving a gift of, and some of this is, okay, the gift of clemency, the gift of being forgiven for something that I should not have been convicted for to begin with. I'm just got to, you know, all on my soapbox during this next hour. As long as we point the finger away from ourselves, away from the institutions that blame and criminalize women and children for their own rape, sexual abuse, trafficking, and slavery, away from the men we, who we normalize as Johns, and as long as we disconnect adult prostitution and the exploitation of children, and disconnect prostitution and trafficking of human beings for the purposes of rape and sex slavery, then we are to blame. And you know who we is, right? And we have assisted in creating well-funded transnational criminal networks, dollar by dollar. So. Who can say it better than Norma, right? Um, I've just finished an article on my clemency experience, actually, like now, right? This week, like yesterday, yesterday last night. <laughs> I want to read just a little bit of it before I continue with the PowerPoint. The resistance of our society to be held accountable, solving mechanisms of structural violence that contribute to the exploitation of human beings is based in male privilege and financial gain. While we have long touted life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as foundational principles of the United States of America, patriarchy and the almighty dollar continue to devalue human life. Lives lose value when the sexual appetites of men are the barometer of normal physical interactions, most often affecting the quality of life for women and girls, but increasingly men and boys and other gender identifications. In satisfying the physical urges of men, I'm sorry, in satisfying their physical urges, men determine who will and who will not enjoy basic rights, clearly outlined in the Declaration of Independence, the United States Constitution, and the United Nations Articles of Human Rights and the Palermo Protocols. So, we'll, we'll publish that eventually. Um, there's a bunch of my sisters, I don't know, who in the room is one of the authors of Exit, Prost Exit Prostitution Survivor Policy Platform? Audrey, Alyssa, Benita, Anybody else that can't? You know, these are the glasses, y'all. You, you, did you see me read that? I usually have to, have to get somebody to read it. I can actually see that. I got three pairs of glasses now. I got some brand new shades that cost me $100, which I'm going to wear. <laughs> the old glasses, which these actually function, function as readers when I'm on the computer, and now that these glasses, I can see, you know, a little distance. So now I got three cases. It's a mess. Anyway, Kaylee, don't look at me like that. I know it's silly, right? But anyway, and yes, there will be a joke or two, dry or not, because it is a difficult subject, as Anna said. It is a very diff difficult subject. And again, if there are any, I don't know who is in attendance, if there are any new survivors uh, uh, you know, that are triggered by anything that I might say, if you have plenty of loving and caring people here, uh, I'll just point out, we just find somebody. They'll find the right people, OK? But do not sit there and be in pain if there's anything said. If you were triggered by that video, find somebody, please. Because you being OK is more important than anything else. So 13 of us published the Dignity Journal, an article that was our take on what policy, a policy platform should look like. And I just thought it might be interesting to talk a little bit about the main parts of it but give you Marion Hatcher's take on it and why it's so important to me to contribute. 
So the first tenet, as we called it, was you know reform is necessary in the criminal justice system, which of course goes with what we're saying. That's why it's first with that particular piece. Uh, criminal justice system to recognize survivors as victims of crime and not perpetrators while holding those who exploited them as fully responsible. So many of you know that I am also the John Slayer. Um, I work for the Cook County Sheriff's Office. Like I said in the video, I received the benefit of a huge and extraordinary outpouring of grace and mercy from God to go from inmate to employee, work, went to jail, and the jailer gave me a job. That, of course, it has its own responsibility that comes with it. And this right here is one of the most important ones because we deal with, in the jail that I started my journey in, we deal with uh, everywhere that we go, women and girls who are either in jails or prisons or have been in jails or prisons who are facing, or they're facing jail or prison for their own victimization. There's something entirely unacceptable about that. Absolutely unacceptable. And so, in, while we can't do anything about the current way the criminal justice system is instantaneously, we have to do the best with what we have by doing projects like what Shea and this institution and the wonderful uh, assistants that worked on it and the wonderful people. Hi, Liza, can I see you? <laughs> <laughs> wonderful people to develop a tool to help people understand the importance of an attorney in the experience, a trauma-informed, what she calls a trauma-informed lawyering, I sometimes trip over that, trauma-informed lawyering, is crucial to walking with us when we have the opportunity to take whatever avenue to clear our record. Might not be fair, might have to admit, so excuse my French, Jesus, I know I'm in an institution of, of, of learn, faith-based learning somewhere <coughs> in the tennis, but admit some shit we just shouldn't have to. Yes, I had to say some stuff in my, and I had to say some stuff that really, you know what I'm saying, it really, really kind of stuck in my craw because my trafficker sent me out there to buy drugs. He's still in the basement. I'm in handcuffs going to jail. That's how it goes. I'm the one being repeatedly raped, serially raped, maintaining a high on crack cocaine because there's no other way to deal with it, even though in my situation the drugs came before the prostitution. For me, it was domestic violence, getting repeatedly beaten by a husband who was just absolutely, I think I said in the video, just really good looking. But he was a sociopath. He's good now, because I got God healing, he's good, everybody's good now, but back then it was terrible. He put a gun to my oldest son's head. He assaulted my mother. That you, Elizabeth? Hey, girl! <laughs> His glasses are popping. <laughs> oh my God. We lived in terror from this man. So domestic violence led to drugs, because I got involved in the drugs. You don't have enough time to get to all of that. Google me, because somewhere I talked about it. But the point is, it was domestic violence, the drugs, ran from the domestic violence, you can't go to your family, because how are you going to go to your family? Already threatening and beating on family there, you're going to go to who? You can't go to friends, because then you're putting them at risk, right? Ran to the street. The street welcomes you when you are in pain. It is your apparent, apparent and a friend, and it's like, come on, I got you. I got you. And once you're there, somebody's going to offer you your first free hit. You're already strung out in my case, right? That first free hit, then you just start going and going and going, and you ended up wherever. You know those little things in the springtime? 
that white stuff that makes you sneeze, and this is some kind of version of pollen. Some smart person here knows the name of it. All I know is that little, I, some people call it money in the, black folks call it money. I don't know why, it's not. <laughs> but anyway, I just went from here to there to here to there. One time I walked from the south side to the west side in somebody else's shoes. <laughs> two sizes too small in the snow. Because crack told me to go. And the pain behind me was too much to face. So in there, not only was I a victim of domestic violence, I eventually became a victim of sex trafficking because somebody said, Come on, you stay in the basement with me. I'll bring the tricks. I'll keep the drugs <laughs> flowing. You won't have to deal with that behind you. I stayed high, so it was like three weeks I can remember. I was under the influence of crack cocaine for three weeks and did not sleep. It broke the sheriff's heart, Sheriff Dark, who was, you know, like the best sheriff on the planet. <coughs> who I work for, if anybody ever know. It broke his heart to picture me in the ba basement with all those mattresses there, being told, OK, you're going to do this with this one, you're going to do this with that one, male, female, didn't matter. This is what it's about. Not pretty. And pornography is nothing but paid serial rape, that's film. The duration of somebody involved in pornography lasts much less because of the absolute repeated assault on a woman's body. But I'm the one that went to jail. For me, it turned out to be a second chance because I was an overachiever before. So I went to jail. I was an overachiever in jail. Overachieve, they say, okay, she, we're going to keep her. Not in handcuffs, we're going to give her a job. All worked out because I did have a degree before I went to jail. Had, did a lot of cool stuff. Had six figure salary. You know, my degree is from Loyola University in Chicago. Uh, in finance, smarty pants, you know? But like my judge told me, sometimes too smart for my own good. Choices, especially in men weren't the best, and eventually it caught up with me. There was not enough self-love, give a damn about marrying going on, bottom line. I care a whole lot about me today, and I got police on speed dial. <laughs> <laughs> Every day. <coughs> because as I said, I am the John Slayer. I coordinate the largest sex virus sting operation <coughs> in the country. And in 17 sting operations since 2011, we've arrested over 9,000 men trying to buy sex from adults. <laughs> and we're not going to get stuck on that. That's a whole other presentation, as my sisters know. I'm just letting you know, when you let us do us, when the smoke clears or whatever it was you were using, for me it was crack smoke. But when at whatever clears, and you come out of that haze, whether it, because some of us don't use drugs, but whatever it is, whether we address the trauma, get clean and address the trauma, figure out how to take those baby steps, somebody believes in us, somebody trusts us. One of the presentations earlier struck me, and I, I have grown up so much because I used to interrupt people, even when they were doing their stuff. I'm like, don't say nothing, don't say nothing. I try to remember it. Just so you know, and I've sent it to our hosts, some of you may already know, uh, I have the privilege of working with Rob Spector, ChildSafe.ai uh, developer, just published uh, on the wire, a Beyond Back page a year later, whatever you call it. Um, and I'm a, one of the editors of that document, and it's really, really good. Um, it gives you an idea of the landscape. But the one thing that was missing, and I don't know who talked about that page being um, taken down being a good thing, but the disservice done to victims or the disservice done to independent sex workers, whatever they want to call themselves, I'm not with that, but you do what you do, you're grown. It's just that the majority 
are not doing this as something that they would like to continue doing if they had another option. But the point is, regardless whether you're doing it willingly, whether you is a lifestyle, whatever it is, the Department of Justice, the FBI, they don't work for cops. They get it, right? I've been there 15 years. I went from handcuffs to meeting with the sheriff. Obviously, they get it. They give me like, I don't know how many promotions because they get it. We don't arrest prostituted women anymore. They get it. But guess what? If the federal government had got it, they would have had part of their plan, their strategic plan that I don't doubt was extremely immense. They would have included victim services, exit opportunities for those who wanted to exit, or at least stabilization for those who wanted to continue. And since they did not, they caused a whole lot of hell for a lot of folks. I can say it. Now, depending on where you are, some of them went to the street. The majority of the country, everybody go to the street. A lot of places they did. Seattle they did, Phoenix they did. But some folks just went to other indoor opportunities. There's all kinds of things that they did. And one of the really cool things that I do, which is I have to pray every time I do it, I do covert stuff with the, 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 the artificial intelligence. I post the fake ads. I post fake profiles to catch bad guys and waste their time. They think they're talking to the botnics and <laughs> talking to a potential quote unquote seller. And they're talking to a girl that I developed, that I created that ain't never showing up. And we got some real sickos that will just, even once we send a deterrence message that they are communicating on one of the ads, we don't let them know which ad, so it comes from another number, but they don't know when they could get popped, but they keep on communicating. I got some that have communicated 90 plus times, even though, how sick is that? That's insane. But this is the mindset. I had some very disgusting commun communications come across the platform yesterday. I have to stay prayed up to do this work. God allowed me to have the right therapy and continued therapy to deal with my trauma, my PTSD, in order to do it. But I won't back up, and I know people to call if I get triggered. When I wrote my application for clemency, I got triggered left and right. My bosses, he's director of public policy, my chief, the sheriff, everybody had to give me some love Benita, everybody had to tell me to keep going. Because my PTSD told me to run. Don't finish this, you got work to do. You got too much stuff to do. You got to do, organize the, the next something. Instead of working on something that was gonna clear my name. Because it was hard. That's why it was really important and scary when Shay said, well, how about, <laughs> How about we do this? And you know Shay. She had the funding for the doggone thing in two days. I was like, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to do with this girl? Did I read that other thing? Because I got to talking. I didn't read it, did I? No, the second one. Did I read the second one? Oh, yeah, I guess I read it. You know, I'm Reverend Dr. Mary Hatcher. I'll get to preaching and go all off the <laughs> script. I think we got the point on the first one. You get the point. We get the point. We can talk about it later. We can share, right? But the system is broken. It's not even, it doesn't even, broken doesn't begin to define how See, I want to use bad words now. <laughs> How effed up it really is. When you hold the victim accountable for what somebody else did to them. Where else do you see that? Do we see that somewhere else? They used to do it with domestic violence victims. But where else? Does your body become a commodity 
and you're held accountable for the abuse. <coughs> she did it because she went, yes, I like getting my ass whipped. I'm sorry, I have to keep it real. No, nobody wants to be beaten, forced, made to, whatever word, coerced. The words don't matter. The point is, when everybody in this room was seven, they didn't want to grow up to be called somebody's bitch. They didn't want to grow up to be, and yeah, I just say the word, because you know, that's, i 57, who gonna stop <laughs> Because we have to keep it real. I can't help the next person in this work without keeping it real. It's not a pretty subject. I'm not gonna use, like, really icky words, but a few of them have to get the point across. <laughs> The second tenant, reform necessary to assist survivors in finding fair employment by offering vocational training, financial counseling, and educational scholarships, as well as offering employment opportunities that utilize survivors' vast array of skills and interests. Now, I could not wait to get to this one and tell you guys one of my really good skills when I was on the street. And don't, get, don't be thinking nasty now. I wasn't going there. Because everybody, they assume everybody had some sexual prowess. That's not the point. For me, I could fix your crack pipe so you could smoke on <coughs> I took that college education from Loyola University <coughs> and somehow figured out how to manipulate the choy boy, the chore boy, you know, it's the, the filter in a crack pipe and make you be able to smoke longer. That was a big deal in the street. Come on, anybody with crack smokers in the room? Nobody? For real? Hey, girl. Now, you know that was a skill. I, I had a lot of friends because of that. Because, see, when you run out of drugs and you got somebody that's got some, some, some mm -hmm. hey, we're still smoking, right? We have a lot of skills. And when we were in the street, we can count money better than you. Although we got to give it to do. Amen. Amen. There are skills in the street that can translate into something useful. But there's also the ability to learn, depending on where you enter the sex trade. In Chicago, 62% enter the sex trade by age 18, 87% by age. 21. So we're selling our children. I was an anomaly. I entered the sex trade <coughs> in my uh, mid 30s. Was only involved in it for a few years. But the point is, you know, other folks they called they, they said, oh, you wasn't really no hoe. Like, guess what? I was hoe enough to get locked up. I was crackhead enough to get talked about, to get labeled. And that's the other. Alyssa, I mean, no, oh, wait a minute, I said it wrong. Alyssa, that's my baby. I'm gonna get a correct here. I know, right? I can't myself because I've been doing something. I'm trying to correct I know, right? How jacked up is it that not only I'm going to jail and call all these names, uh, call the names of the street, but you call the names while I'm locked up. I'm going to face, I was facing three to seven years for a drug charge that it, it was spoken of, I, I believe she spoke of before it was in the video. When you go to jail for charges other than the charge of prostitution or directly related, right? And that's the issue for why in Illinois I had to get clemency for a drug charge and although my application does talk about my trafficking, there is no vacature for anything other than prostitution direct, directly related to prostitution charges. My charge is drugs. I was facing three to seven years of I'm like, wait a minute, because now I'm not high anymore. I'm like, hold the heck up, what happened? I'm not high anymore, I'm like, what did I do? With my smart this year in mind, you know, I had a staff of 25 people in my last corporate position. I managed general company, fixed assets, Medicare cost reporting, accounts payable, 
special projects, a lot of stuff. Cash account, yeah, they used to let me do that. They, I don't think they, they didn't. I wasn't doing nothing crazy back then. But like I said at the end, you shouldn't have to be Marion Hatcher after all these years. I was still a felon up to 13 years in my recovery process because of what the state of Illinois statute said. How good is that? The sheriff said she could, she good, I'm good with her. She gave me, he gave me, I don't, like I said, I lost track of the number of promotions, the titles that I've had. Straight out of jail, they let me volunteer, they hired me within 10 months. Come on, 10, 12 months. The sheriff of Cook County, he had, he's the one that had my butt locked up. And she, he said she good. Give her a job, Eliza said, well, give her a job. Let me represent them all over the doggone place, right? Local, state, national, international. Congressional Hill, White House, United Nations. Go on, Mary, go wherever you gotta do. You make us look good, don't mess up. So for up until that point, when we were with President Carter, I don't know who was there, raise your hand. We, those of us who were with President yeah. Carter in 2015, right, please? Yep. Anybody remember me saying, President Carter, I've been a good girl for nine years. I should still be a convicted felon. Mm -hmm. <coughs> That's real talk right there. A sheriff of Cook County. I'm sitting up there with my survivor sisters. We talking, we chilling with Jimmy Carter, coolest president. Well, Barack is the coolest president. <laughs> but, Jimmy, but Jimmy, the nicest, will cut you with human rights, truth, president ever. We bum rushed the Secret Service to get a picture with him. That just show you, yes, that part of us that was in the streets and in jail, was not, we were not leaving the room without a picture with President Jimmy Carter. It's like, say it again. Transferable skills. Crazy boy. And Benita, you know, she big mama, she got the selfie with him. I said, go ahead. I said, well, I told him we were related. Yeah. Benita <laughs> yeah. Carter. Cousin Benita Carter. Christmas Carter. Some of the smartest human beings that I know have been trafficked. That's why when we had the opportunity to write our own policy platform, because I'm like, I love allies. I love the men who don't buy sex. Most of the men don't buy sex. Okay, like was said earlier. I got stats coming out of my ears on that. Many of us in this room who are, wrote the policy platform, we were the peer reviewers of the demand abolition report that was talked about earlier. We are the experts, and, they, and, and many of our allies trust us. And we appreciate that. But guess what? We did not need our allies to be in the room or even at the table when we wrote that platform. We had the skill set amongst the 13 of us, well, speaking of 13 <coughs> of us, come on, uh, can I get some water? Please, there. We know how to do stuff. <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned, it's a piece of art, because guess what? Other than somebody in another country, I can't remember if it's the Philippines or India, thank you. I know there's another peer written uh, policy article. I think ours is amazing. Not just because we did it, just because it is. Now I'll tell you if it was garbage. But it didn't get published in Dignity. In the Dig in Dignity Journal, you know, University of Rhode Island, Donna Hughes. Donna was not putting her name on that stuff if it was garbage, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the most important things, that's why there was absolutely nothing else that I could talk about today other than that at this point, because it's come full circle. Doing the video with Shay and my attorney, who held my hand, I think I left that part out, when I wanted to turn and run from continuing the process, the painful process, because you got to write about the pain in order for them to forgive you for the pain. It's like, what the hell? 
Where, is, where does that make sense? I got to admit to you in the way that you're going to accept it. We were very careful about how we wrote it. Okay. I wasn't going to just say, I wasn't getting ready to lie to me. I was guilty of the lifestyle. But that particular incident, which is what you have to write about, you, anybody want to do it, you need to do it, I'll help you tell the truth without lying. <laughs> you see, I can look at anybody in this room today and tell the truth about me. That was not something I could do before. Today, it's a necessity for me to breathe air, for me to be able to tell the truth. My integrity is everything to me today. I, I grieve for those involved in the sex trade who cannot meet their basic needs. This is the most unfair thing that I can imagine. And then you wonder why folks go back to what they know. Because see, my introduction to it, my, my tenure in it was short-lived. I had a skill set that the sheriff's office said, hmm, we're going to use that. That's not the norm. The norm is having entered early, having not been given opportunities that you should have been given, and needing somebody to understand that while you did that, went through that, that if you, under the right set of circumstances, you're going to be Dr. So-and-so and going, I don't know what the heck you're doing, Alisa at school. What are you doing at school now? Mass is a public dog on administration. You go, girl. <laughs> That's Chris back there. Doctor. Hi, baby. That's another smart one. Got all these smart people in the room. And Kathleen and Anita. They'll talk that stuff. They can tell you the truth about this historically all the way up to today. Enjoy. We ain't going to start with joy because <laughs> it, it'll be a whole nother hour. Thank you. I don't know who else is in the room, uh, even though the glasses are working. I just, you know, thank God it's, it's just beautiful to see all of you caring. But the system is broken. That's why we wrote what we wrote. And so you can use it, you can cite it, you can share it, do whatever you got to do with it. Oh, Jesus. Did I get here already? These systemic changes are net. Go back, go back. I wasn't quite ready yet. That's my baby. She gets emails from me, text messages at 2 o'clock in the morning. The systemic changes that are necessary or whatever to recognize survivors. <laughs> and, oh yeah, as the valuable human beings we are, and to support survivors in fulfilling our vast potential. I guess I did get there. I think I got on my soapbox, didn't I? But this is the truth. And so the, to me, while we come together in these, I feel the, the best way for me to does she, girl, you don't go back to that slide. <laughs> feel the best way for me to really get across what this means to me is by being the best Marion that I can be. By telling folks that I'm a survivor of prostitution and using the term prostitution as much as I can. Trafficking will come out of there somewhere but more than 80% of those involved in the sex trade have been trafficked at some point. I got research on that, if you want it, I'll send it to you. But the bottom line is, who cares? Because if you did not have a direct quote unquote person benefiting, which is not the norm, <coughs> society has been dependent. Because society didn't give you what you needed. Society forced you to do what you had to do. And the other small group, once they got grown enough to decide that they wanted to sell their bodies to meet their basic needs, we're going to leave that for another conversation. It's unfortunate that that small group is making a lot of noise and it's got a lot of money from a bunch of billionaires that want to legalize 
legalize, decriminalize, I don't give a crap. Which way you go with it, the only thing that matters is decriminalizing the sellers or the victim, whatever you want to call them, because some people are now wanting to change the language. In my day, they called us the seller. In my flow charts, I'm a seller. Was. In my day, I was a seller. She was a seller. She was a seller. I think I already did that. But then, this is a business model. This is a demand-driven business. No buyers, no business. Which is a cliche, but doggone it, it's a fact. And guess what? On a daily basis. I get my all to interrupting, disrupting, deterring, getting all up in their way, mm -hmm. and getting ones I can't get arrested. Now, with that said, that's my vast potential. That's why they named me the John Slayer. <laughs> but guess what? I'm also mentoring a reformed sex buyer. Because I got Jesus, and Jesus tells me, you wanted forgiveness, you wanted understanding, you wanted somebody to get the point that you, yes, I was exploited, but some of the stuff I did, I just did. That's my story. I gotta keep it real. I told you today I'm telling the truth. <coughs> so I've forgiven him and I am mentoring him and we have a presentation that we want and hopefully we'll get the opportunity to do publicly. And I'm guiding him to understand not to, how to re-disrespect, re re-exploit, talk about stuff he don't know nothing about. He can't speak to the survivor experience. He might get whooped if he tries. <laughs> but he, he is valuable in that I want to know why he bought it. I want to ask him that question. I want to ask him in front of you and you and you. I want to know, did he buy a, did he buy a minor? Why is he on a sex offender registry? I want to know what he did to stop. I want to know what he thinks today about what he did. The name of the presentation is, I represent the worst of everything that's happened to you. So even in the title, he's taking ownership. I want to know. You want to know. So <coughs> I say this to give you an example of my today and how it applies to the policy platform that me and my other 12 sisters put our blood, sweat, and tears in, and uh, I think it was a little over a year experience. Everybody in this room is surviving from something. But if you haven't survived from being a commodity, having a price, on your head, or your vagina, or some other orifice, you need to talk to the experts. Survivors have to be at the table, and doggone it, they have to be at the head of the table. That's my opinion. They have to be side by side, walk side by side, be with. There are very few people that I know, there's a couple in the room though, Elizabeth, that's the baddest trainer on the planet. Eliza, policy coming out of her eyeballs. <laughs> I respect them so much. Shay, everybody, law enforcement in the room, my people. But don't forget, this is our experience. There are, why are there so many organizations that talk about anti-trafficking, their names got it in there, they're getting money for it, and I don't see nobody that went through it. I'm just saying. Why are grants opportunities and all of these different funding streams not requiring 
stakeholders, not in your little committees. Come on now, that ain't doing nothing for them. They got to feed their family. Give them a dog on job, 100% benefits everything. I feel extremely valued the Cook County Sheriff's Office. Sometimes it'll be like, okay, they don't value me quite so much. Right. <laughs> I'm on call 24 seven and whew. But I don't say that for long because it's a blessing. Right? It's a responsibility and it's a blessing. Psst, psst. But finally, standards of care for survivors exiting prostitution should focus on supporting survivors in our journeys and support short and long-term resources that empower us. We were very careful with this part. Alyssa, Lisa, Alyssa, Alyssa, Lisa. Masters and whatever the heck you've talked about, I see you. You and Audrey just out of pocket. I mean, Audrey already was out of pocket. I've seen that before. The girl, it was the day you, the woman told you it was the first time. And then you know what she told me? I, you shouldn't have your face on all these doggone things. If you were not uh, all, every, what did you say? <laughs> See, I thought she was going to do that. That's how she does. But she cut me. I couldn't say nothing about it. She was right. <laughs> Basically, she's like, stop being every damn way, and then I don't think it's new. <laughs> so, we were very careful with this because, because I am a recovering addict and we'll be celebrating 15 years of sobriety in July. have mental health issues, have still got them, PTSD, whatever you want to call it. That is not what you should focus on. We need treatment in some cases. That's not what should be up here. Right? <laughs> Standards of care is the term we use because we want to be very careful with how you who are not part of the survivor community view us. A lot of people just want to chalk it up to put them in treatment. Treatment by itself will not work. What we went through, we have to have a high-end, trauma-informed environment, right? Not only we have to have the right environment, but we have to have the right type of contact with people who aren't judging us people who are trained to understand what we went through, and people who respect the fact that when we get okay, we're going to run over them and try to take their job. I'm just kidding, but I'm serious. <laughs> because we can. And that's only saying that we have the ability to do so. I mean, I'm not being disrespectful. I don't want to be disrespectful anymore. But we want survivors of this human rights violation to have the ability, if they want to, to have any job of anyone in here, to have the life, the financial stability, the future of anyone in here and beyond. We were not born with price tags. We weren't born with barcodes. We were born with the same spirit, soul, hopes, and dreams of everybody in this room. And so, hopefully, I brought a little bit of our platform for policy for exit and prostitution. We made sure we put exit in here because this whole, everybody wanna be this or that, you know, the so sex workers over there, the, they want to try to take the term survivor. Survivor from what? How are you surviving and you say this is what you want to do? That's another conversation. We live and breathe the policy platform that, that we made available to you. Uh, focusing on the clemency, obviously, is a huge part. The vacature that I did not qualify for, so I had to take the avenue that it presented itself. These are important things for you to be able to have a discussion at the table here, and when you leave, go back to your 
wherever you work, when you're talking to people in your community, if you're on Capitol Hill, if you have any uh, global conversations, our platform hopefully will give you another tool. Thank you.